Evening and welcome. Television, like movies and theatre, is about moments. You rarely remember the entire show, but sometimes the odd instance stays in the mind. So tonight we thought we'd recall a few moments that we particularly remembered from the past two years of Parkinson in Australia. We'll see the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Bob Hawke, meet the man who impersonates him, Max Gillis. Not to mention a more unlikely combination, the former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Malcolm Fraser, discussing the realities of political life with Bob Hope. We recollect the non-interview of The Decade with Miss Koo Stark and the scoop of the series, Princess Anne. Then there are appearances from Elton John, Ringo Starr, Brian Brown, Lee Marvin, Twiggy, Cliff Young, Shirley Temple, Neville Rann, Penelope Keith, Val Lehman, Jermaine Greer, Cleo Lane, and many others. And we'll also be recalling some of the moments you didn't see, the ones that until now languished on the cutting room floor, like these. All right, well, now you've got another show to do, Listen, haven't you? Listen, you're interrupting me. I am indeed. I'm oh, sorry to tell you your precious time. Slip out, of, slip out of this little number here, and you leave it alone. I know what you're like for pink. <laughs> How many changes do you have, in fact? In How the, many changes do I have? About 50. 50? Where do you I get all... I have to go now, Michael, because I have, I've got a show to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we go to a break, I'd like to meet a newfound friend of mine. His name is Slim. You do meet a better class of person. Go, Slim. Go, Slim. 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 Go on, Slim. Good morning. He's gone. <laughs> Is that Slim? Right. Slim, where are you? Slim. <laughs> Here he is. Go on, bugger off, you two. Go on, scram. <laughs> I've always thought of the talk show as being an unnatural act performed by two or more people in public. What's unnatural about it is that in an atmosphere designed to test the strongest nerve, surrounded by a million dollars worth of awesome technology, the guest is supposed to have an intimate and relaxed chat with the host. Well, sometimes it never happens. Sometimes both interviewer and interviewee find themselves in a conversational no-man's land where the only thing they've got in common is a desire to be somewhere else. Sometimes, though, it works, and people forget their surroundings long enough to relax and give the audience a glimpse of the private self behind the public image. Childhood, adolescence, the terrible business of growing up are things we all have in common and are fruitful areas for revelations and humour. My father was a policeman, just like Carson's Law, and, uh, but he, uh, as well he was uh, an amateur magician and ventriloquist, yeah. so he taught me um, how to do ventriloquism with the doll. And how old were you when you were doing this? Oh, I think from about five onwards. I know the doll was as big as I was, or a little bit bigger. Jerry, yes. his name. He had red hair yeah. and a white costume with purple pom-poms. And how did you... Can you remember the act? No, I can remember uh, the song was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But, um, I mean, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you can't remember the voice at all? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, a little bit. Do you want to hear something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go on. Well I, well, I have to put my hand up. Of course, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's Jerry, sure. Well, yeah. Jerry, you have to hold this his is, head. This is Jerry. <laughs> this, right, this, this is Jerry. This is Jerry. But well, you see, that's right, that's Jerry. But you have to look at Jerry because when you're of doing course. a ventriloquist act, I you, won't look you, it. Don't... you misdirect. Actually, could you be my doll? Certainly. Can you swing around with me? Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Jerry. Will you put your hand up on the back? Oh, yes, yes, I'm going to do that. But what you have to do when I'm singing is go like this. Right? Ready? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Good boy, Jerry. <laughs> Is it true that not only did you always remember your own lines, but everybody else is on the set? Unfortunately, that's true. It is? Yes. So that when they... Lionel Barrymore, very angry. Really? Yes, he's, he swore. Why? Uh, he swore because uh, he didn't like someone this high telling him what to say when he'd forgotten his lines. And of course, when he swore, I got sent home because <laughs> you're not allowed to use any profanity around a child. So I, <laughs> I got sent home a lot. <laughs> 
And I'd say, Mother, what are those funny words that that man used? And, and she said, oh, he's sick, dear. He's sick. Well, he was tied an emotional more often than not, was he not, according to I don't know. They brought his, his words in on a blackboard, finally, so that we could finish the little colonel. <laughs> well, were you uh, encouraged uh, along the way uh, yes. in your ambition? Yes, very much so, by, by my mother, mm -hmm. yes. I mean, I had lots of aunts and uncles who weren't so encouraging. I was always very tall. I was this height when I was 14, which was quite a hazard then. How tall is that? It's about 5'10", I think. Yeah. I lied so much. I started off at 5'8". <laughs> so you didn't get work if you were 5'10". So, um, but I think I've grown to about 5'10", 5'10 and a half. And all these aunts and uncles would say things like, hello, haven't you grown? You know, that was the first question, not how are you? Yeah. Till eventually I used to say, hello, haven't I grown? You know. <laughs> um, <laughs> But then I got My various things. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I got various sort of helpful. You want what do you what do you be when you grow up? An, an actress, auntie, an actress. Will you ever find a leading man large enough? And all those really helpful things, you know. And in fact, even when I'd started my second job, I went along to a very frightening lady who ran the Folkestone rep. And I had had six months in weekly rep doing a different show every week. And I felt very grand. I thought I'd got a whole load of experience under my belt. And she asked me what I'd done, and I gave my great long list of parts. And she cooled off a bit. And um, I, I, you know, and I thought, well, what is with her? And eventually she looked up at me and said, how tall are you? And I was in my lying phase. And I said, five, eight, a bit. She said, well, I don't think we'll ever be able to use you, Miss Keith. You see, our proscenium arch isn't very tall. <laughs> I take it that, uh, that your height and your build was an advantage for you as a, as a swimmer. Was it at the same time an embarrassment for you as a, when you were a young, young girl? It was an embarrassment not in swimming. Um, in swimming, people seemed to be more sensible. They didn't refer to it at all. It didn't matter at all. Mm. Um, and it certainly didn't help at all. I mean, maybe when you dive in, you get a little further than the other person but that's the only advantage but socially did you find that people used to come and say extraordinary things to you no no the worst the worst people i found were the people you met in lifts the people you meet in lifts are not very good anyway <laughs> <laughs> i mean elevators and they they'd say things like you know is it cold up there and i used to just shrivel i was so embarrassed and so uncomfortable and suddenly I realised, you know, how stupid to be like that. Why didn't I back answer them? So I did. And I used to say things like, the air is very rare up here and you're unlikely to appreciate it. And, you, of course, you met Goff up there too, didn't you? <laughs> yes, yes. There was, still up there. There wasn't much chance of you and Goff missing each other, was there, across no, a crowded room? that's very true. I yeah. did see him across a crowded room. Do you really? Yes. Yeah. yes. When, when we met, it was across a crowded room. Yes. And you've had, what, around 40 years of, uh, of marriage with... 40 with, years with, of married with, bliss. 40 of, of really married bliss. Of course. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, most of it's been bliss and some of it's been other than bliss. <laughs> what about the, the, the problem of being as small as you are? Uh, did it lead to sort of psychological problems when you were a child? Did... Well, as a child, I don't think that much, but I think from about the age of 18. Really? You know, I grew up in the rock and roll era. <laughs> Imagine me doing a rock and roll with a five foot eleven girl <laughs> and trying to sort of whiz around and you know, whiz it between my legs. <laughs> I didn't do it very often, but I never ever dropped a woman. <laughs> never, not, never dropped one. It's better than cheek to cheek. Cheek to cheek, I was cheek to chest. <laughs> you know, occasionally I danced with some some of the women that I danced with Fedica. Especially one of those close ones, you know, occasionally uh, Elvis sings those very nice sort of love ballads. And imagine me dancing with a well-endowed lady. <laughs> not only could I not see where I was going, <laughs> I couldn't hear the bloody music. <laughs> uh, dear. But you, you did all right, did you? Oh, yes. You, I've, you know, by the time I was about 22, I thought to myself, well... You know, I don't consider myself small. You don't? No, I'm not really small. No. I would say I'm concentrated man. <laughs> you, don't, you don't mind uh, do, doing the sort of uh, short jokes? Short always... jokes are a mainstay. Now, I've done short jokes since I was this high. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> and you, don't, you don't just cut yourself off because I did them to protect myself. I was a little kid, I was a new kid in school. I went to nine schools by the time I was in the ninth grade, you know? So I was always getting beaten up, except for two, if people were laughing, 
And the other time was if I had a summer cold and a runny nose. The guys would go, oh, that's disgusting. <laughs> and they let me go. What's the best short joke you've heard about yourself? Oh, well, Pat McCormick is, you know, who I, I do the Smokey and the Bandit pictures with, is the master of the short joke. Pat is the one who pointed out that uh, Paul Williams is very superstitious. He will not walk under a black cat. You know? <laughs> he described me once as an, as an aerial photograph of a human being. You look like an aerial <laughs> photograph. Yeah. But you know what? The, the short jokes, I think... <laughs> I, it's funny, isn't it? It's a lovely it's, it's, You know, I was stationed on Pat during the war, you know. It was, <laughs> Pat's a huge man, if you don't know who he is, but... I think, honestly, that, that there's... I hope there's more fiber to my character than just short jokes. Mm. But I think I understand why I've done them. And I'm trying to cut down, you know, and... and uh, <laughs> you know, but, but, God, you just don't cold turkey something like that. And some things that happen to you are just funny. When you go to get your hair cut and they ask a 42-year-old man to sit on the little board, it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but you were, you were, as you said, you were very shy, weren't you, Ooh, when you were a child? Right. Yeah. yeah. When, I'm sure. what, what happened when people, relatives, came to see you, for instance, or came to your house? What did you do then? Oh, when my aunties wanted to kiss me, I used to shoot up a tree. They couldn't catch me. <laughs> really? <laughs> like a monkey, yeah. Uh, and I'm... sit up there and they went away. <laughs> <laughs> and what about when you went to the sort of dances and social functions. Mm. What, do, did you try and approach girls there? Sure. But uh, I mean, they used to be rattling going over before I spoke to them. And when I got over there, I couldn't get any words out. <laughs> and I had to go up and chat like that and couldn't get anything out. The girl would say, no, thanks, and I'd go home and go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> About six months before I'd approach him again, <laughs> making enough courage to get back. So you're making up for lost time now, Yeah, I you? think so. Yeah. yeah. What about the other... You've got a girlfriend now, haven't you? Uh, sort of, yeah. I've only seen her twice. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, it's fair dinkum, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's fair dinkum. I don't know, but where do you meet at Cliff? Oh, I met her up at uh, Sydney at a tourist bureau sh show. You might know when it was on. You yeah. know, tourist, right. tourism. Or yeah, right. Country, don't say her name, don't say her name. No, I won't say no, no. Mm -hmm. I met her there and had a... I kissed her. I kissed her. <laughs> and, uh, down in Melbourne, I kissed her again, so I was working around her. Yeah. But, when you, but you must have, didn't you chat her at all? Do you talk to her as well? Oh, I'm only kiss her. I haven't got time to talk to her. <laughs> One of the common assumptions about people who become famous is that they were born that way. In fact, what I've discovered in all the interviews I've done is that if the guests had anything in common, it's that they were born in ordinary circumstances, but what set them apart was that they had a dream that one day they might become special. Here are just a few of the guests we've had on the show talking about their steps up the ladder to fame and fortune. You know, your parents always want you to be, have, be better off than what they are, you know. Um, they always forget that you admire what they've got and be pleased to have what they've got. But um, uh, I was very good at school and I imagined that I'd go on, you go on to become a, a bank manager or a doctor or, you know, whether you do or not, but that's the sort of thing, given my education, I could think about, you know, but I actually set out to study to become an actuary, which is a sort of mathematician, but um, that was boring, so I left that. Well, you, you also, you were a salesman, weren't you? Oh, yeah, I was a salesman. What do you sell? Tell me an Australian that isn't. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did you sell? Well, I wanted to buy a car when I left school, and I was studying to be an actor, and I wasn't getting much money there. So I thought, a mate said, he said, look, I've got this great job, mate. He said, you just go around with a bag, and you sell Manchester and lingerie to girls at night. <laughs> I thought, and I'm huddled over figures every day. So I... You were huddled over figures every night. night. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'd give it a go. And I would go around at night and present show lingerie, Manchester and stuff like that to girls and tell them how... You'd, go up, you'd walk along Central Station, you'd go up to a girl and you'd say, would you like to see something pretty? Do you like beautiful things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you, oh, if you did it now, if you did it now, you'd be arrested. <laughs> you should be arrested for a bad line. <laughs> What, in fact, did your dad, the, the fish porter, think when you announced you wanted to be an actor? He thought I'd turned gay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was very suspicious when I said I wanted to be an actor. And he thought I was gay, especially in the theatre, you wear a lot of makeup in order to accentuate the eyes and everything. And when I first went into the theatre, everyone else, all the other guys in the thing, in, in the company, 
were gay. But I, I, I didn't really know what a gay person was. I just thought they were kind of funny guys. <laughs> and they taught me how to do makeup, which of course meant that it was a completely feminine makeup. And I had some pictures taken in this makeup. And when my father saw them, he practically had a stroke. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your mum and dad, because they, I know that, uh, that um, they're both characters, actually, oh, aren't they? My yeah. mum is hysterical. Yeah. They've been married. I mean, God, my mum would kill me, but they're both in their 70s. She won't hear me say this. she will never forgive me if, she, if I did. Um, and she and my dad have been together for, oh, you know, 50 years. And, you know, they love each other, but she nags him like you can't believe. <laughs> oh. I mean, I know she loves him, but she, I think it's because they've been together for so long. <laughs> And my dad's so used to it, and he's slightly... Well, he's quite deaf in one ear, so he just turns his hearing aid off. <laughs> which, is, which I don't blame. Him. Um, you know, they... You know, as I say, they've been together for so long. And she's, she also suffers a little bit with her nerves, and she doesn't like riding in cars very much. So about five years ago, they decide to go on holiday. And my dad's got a, a little... He had a little, like, mini car. It was a, an imp, I think, which is about the size of a mini. And he said, he said, I went over to visit for the day, and he said, I'm thinking of taking Mum down to, um, I don't know where it was, somewhere in Devon. And I said, well, don't you suggest it, because if you suggest it, she won't want to go there just to be awkward. Oh, let me suggest it. Anyway, I didn't, and he ended up saying, oh, let's go down to so-and-so. And she said, I don't want to go there, you know, which I knew she would. Anyway, he said, well, let's drive down, and if you don't like it when we get there, because he knows what she's like, he said, you know, to have a peaceful holiday, we'll go where you want to go, so she agreed. So they set off really early because she doesn't like them going too fast. <clears throat> I mean, it took them about ten hours to get from London to Devon, I think. But, um, and she always rides in the back because she's nervous. <laughs> she's got her own chauffeur, right? So they set off. And my dad, bless him, you know, he's, like, he's not a very good driver. I, I hate driving with him, actually. And because he never looks in his rearview mirror. Oh, God. Anyway. Well, your mother's in the back, that's why. <laughs> And, and also, he talks and she never answers because she's watching the road and watching the speedometer. <laughs> so, anyway, they get off, they go down, they get down to where he suggested, of course, she, as soon as they drive in, I don't like it. So, he says, all right, and he doesn't argue because he knows better. And he just wants a, a peaceful two weeks holiday. So, they t he says, where do you want to go? And he, she wants to go somewhere that's 20 miles back the other way. So, he turns the car around, they set off. And he needs to go to the toilet. So he sees a big public convenience. He pulls the car into the car park. He gets out and he says, do you want to go now? No, don't want to go. So he goes off and he goes into the gents. She does want to go. She gets out. She goes into the ladies. <laughs> he comes out, gets in the car and drives off. <laughs> <laughs> the, the great thing is he goes for about 15 minutes. <laughs> And he's, he told me, and he's talking, talk, you know, they're going, he's going along saying, oh, look at those lovely cows now. But he's so used to her not answering. <laughs> but it's a little weenie car. I mean, it's not like a limo. <laughs> so anyway, he's chatting away and, you know, and he, he finally, thank goodness, comes to a railway crossing that's closed. <laughs> and he says, oh, look at all this bloody traffic now. And he turns around and he said he nearly had heart failure. Of course she wasn't there. So he's in a terrible panic because he knows he's going to be in terrible trouble. <laughs> so he's in a one-way street. Oh, it must have been awful. And he turns the car around up on the pavement and they're all hooting him. And he's yelling out the window, I've left my wife behind. <laughs> they must have thought he was a maniac. He gets back to where this, this public convenience is and there's a bus stop there. My mum is waiting at the bus stop to get the bus back to London. <laughs> he pulls the car up. But uh, what I think is the funniest thing of the story is that he pulls the car, opens the door, she gets in, and they never mentioned it. <laughs> I suppose you could describe B, uh, in prisoner, oh, as, a, much, as yeah. a some earth mother, mother figure, couldn't you? Oh, and uh, uh, constantly concerned about her poor darling daughter Debbie, who died, right. and taking any young girl under her wing. Oh, that reminds me, actually, of the, the tragedy there. What, I mean, an awful lot's happened to you in the four and a half years in prison. Have you ever kept a catalogue of exactly the tragedies and disasters befallen you? Not a full catalogue. I'd give you a sort of a rundown, I suppose. Uh, I, uh, well, not I, B. It's so difficult, you see. <laughs> B was uh, convicted of murdering her, her husband's girlfriend. Right. She served ten years, during which time her daughter died of a drug overdose, for which B blamed her husband. So she managed to behave herself, get a parole. She was paroled out. The day after she was released, she killed her husband. <laughs> uh, then she was put back into another life sentence. Uh, re returned, during which time she was bashed 
burned, stabbed very badly by an ex-prison uh, officer who'd become a prisoner and sent to hospital. She escaped from the hospital. She was recaptured. She uh, suffered from amnesia. She suffered from claustrophobia. She was trapped in a caved-in uh, tunnel. She was trapped in a burning prison. She suffered from uh, depression. She attempted, she had contemplated suicide, but then turned around and killed Nola instead. Uh, <laughs> She thought she was having a brain tumour just like her mum had, but no, it turned out to be renal failure, so she had a kidney transplant. <laughs> uh, and so on. It sounds like a day in the life of our royal family. <laughs> All that in four and a half years. All that in four and a half years. Mm. One of the jobs that, that I didn't realise you had was that you used to do cover versions of, of hits for a for a, a sort of a cheap record company. Yeah, well, I mean, they still do them. Um, there was a Robin Gibb number one record called Saved by the Bell, and I did a, a cover version for a Dutch company, which I got paid 25 quid for, and I had to do Saved by the Bell, and the only way I could do it was going, Saved by the Bell, on your own. Fame, like booze, affects people in different ways. Some find it a pleasant sensation, for others it's quite the opposite. Whatever the reaction, it's a rich area for the interviewer, particularly when the man you're talking to is a total original, Mr Cliff Young. Mm. The other thing that I was going to ask you about, about uh, being a celebrity, apart from kissing the girls, is that uh, all the other stuff, I mean, for instance, there's... Didn't somebody want to erect a statue to you? Yeah. But I didn't like that. Why? I thought it was sort of a dead thing, a statue, and the birds didn't have shit on it. <laughs> when I suppose when people meet you first of all, at uh, interviewers particularly, or indeed, or just ordinary people you meet, I suppose you must say that they've got a sort of prejudged thing in their mind about you. They decide that they know about you. They think you're one kind of person. Do you find that? Well, the worst thing is they think they know how I think, mm. and uh, they don't. <laughs> for a number of reasons, but they really don't. So they keep saying, well, you would say, and I sort of sit there and think, no, I wouldn't. <laughs> What's the worst kind of reaction that you get, though? I mean, the public reaction, when people come up to you and say things to you, do people have speeches prepared for you? Though it's not, I mean, what the ordinary public does in the street is fine. I don't mind that at all. It's when you go to dinner parties and some bore has got to hang his Jermaine Greer speech on you. <laughs> and it always takes him a very long time because he's very nervous about it and all that. And you're nodding and, and all the time you just want to say shut up i've heard this three thousand times and it makes no more sense this time than it never did before but instead because it's some friend's house and you can't start hurling dessert all over the place mm -hmm. really i've learned to say oh really which no australian ever does the british got through a war on saying oh really <laughs> <laughs> oh really oh really let's have a look at some of these pictures that you took of the press in fact the first picture it didn't wasn't taken by you that was taken by a friend of yours wasn't was, it mm. see when I, I can never really get a photograph of the press like that because when I come out, there's sort of this frenetic activity as they all dive for their cameras and start frantically clicking away. So I never get them in repose. So that was taken by a friend, and that's, that's, that's a normal everyday scene outside your house right. in London. Yes. All right. Well, actually, they didn't know I was inside the house at that time, so that was outside the house I was in. It was also outside of another friend of mine's house in London, also outside my flat in New York, and also outside my mother's house in Florida. Wherever you go. Those little clusters. Right, next one. Now, that's the scene that greets you at the door every morning, oh. is it? It's getting to know you. Getting to know you. <laughs> right, let's have a look at the next one, then. Now, what's this, this, this guy going, saying? Well, um, that's... Um, a journalist of dubious repute in London, and I think he's saying coo. He's either saying that or his photographer's got too near him with a telescopic lens, isn't he? <laughs> right, let's move on now. Now, an interesting story about this guy. Well, he was... I got to know him quite well, actually. He was following me around on 24-hour surveillance for a month, and it was during the heat wave quite recently in London. And um, I never spoke to him until one day I, he came up to me at 9 o'clock in the morning and he nearly fainted, and I looked at him and he was in a dreadful state. And I got someone to telephone his editor and say, you know, that Miss Stark was simply not prepared to step over dehydrating journalists on her doorstep. It wasn't a very good way to live, and it was tantamount to cruelty. And as she hadn't spoken to him for a month and hadn't acknowledged him, it wasn't likely that she was going to. And um, by the same token, she wasn't going to give anyone else an interview and sent him home. And he went home, did he? Mm. But he wrote a nice piece about him, did he? Very nice, yes. His wife, in fact, thanked me as well. Not for sending him home. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. That, that thing you made there about image, the point you made there, is, is, is quite true, of course. Uh, an observation, I think anybody who reads newspapers would see that 
that uh, there's a fair, it seems to be a fairly selective uh, proposition mm. about uh, depicting members of the royal family. Mm. I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, the Queen has always seemed to be, to be laughing. I'm, I'm sure, Mum, that she doesn't laugh all the time. No, no, she takes an intelligent interest in what's going on, which usually, if it, it's difficult, I always think, to take an intelligent interest and wear a grin. Yes, is it true? You're all rather silly, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And, and again, I mean, other men, I mean, I mean uh, Prince Charles too, I mean, he's exactly the same, and, and, and the Queen Mother. Uh, ah, but men can be more serious. They're allowed to be. Yeah, uh, yeah. They, the, the scales are tipped yes. against women, you yes. think? Yes. Women aren't supposed to be funny either. <laughs> this, this, is true. this is true. I suppose yes. That's a, it's an interesting point because um, I mean they they criticise you. They wouldn't criticise, for instance, a member, a male member of the royal family about his dress, but they, I mean, his suit, not his. <laughs> 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 but um, but certainly, of course, um, and we had an example while you've been here. The press picked up on the fact that uh, you arrived wearing the same suit they claimed as you were wearing in 1978. It's older than that. It's older. <laughs> I'm in exactly the same position as any other citizen. Mm. The only remedy that the law, our system of law, provides uh, for damage to reputation by way of libel or slander is an action mm. in the uh, courts. And I brought an action against the ABC. You're not, you're, but you're not quite like any other citizen, are you, Neville? I mean, you're you're the premier of a state. Yes. And there's a there's a line of thought that might say that having been cleared by the by the commission, that in fact you should be magnanimous in victory. Yes. Well, you see, I don't regard it as a victory, uh, because uh, I didn't start anything, and I regard myself as a victim, not a victor. And uh, it's all very easy for the ABC to say, well, you were exonerated. Why do you complain? But uh, uh, the very complaint uh, is that they harm my reputation and absolutely through my life, uh, my career, everything that I hold dear into turmoil. Now they say, well, you've been exonerated, why should you worry? Well, why one standard for me and another standard for other people? You, you had this, this problem of, of drinking. Now, I've known you for many, many years. I've known you since, since you were 16. and We've been friends all that time. I never ever, you see, thought that you were an alcoholic. I thought you were a very heavy drinker at mm -hmm. times, a social drinker, but not an alcoholic. Yet, yet you say you are. Yeah, I think really you hide it from friends. Uh, I think, uh, you know, what was happening, whereas if you and I'd go out for a drink and have a real nice evening, you know, you'd go home to the wife and kids, I'd go out and do a late drinking spot. Mm -hmm. And then when I'd finished there, I'd find a spot that opened at 9 o'clock in the morning. I, uh, I never got to the stage, I would never woke up every morning looking for a drink. But I became what we call a, a bout drinker. You know, about, I, I about. actually went uh, sometimes, uh, one, I think the longest time, it was 22 days drinking solidly without food. That's when I figured there was a problem. And it's, <laughs> it's actually, it's, uh, it's not a problem. I'm an alcoholic. And I know because you're a, a good friend, my closest friends find it more difficult to understand than people, you know, who were strangers. When you had that 22 day bout, George, can you remember anything about it at all? I went through uh, yeah, a spell where I couldn't remember anything. You know, I remember the early part and maybe the, the final part, but there was maybe a week in between where I had a total blackout. And just recently, you know, I suppose I'm lucky because just recently I met uh, one of the biggest pop stars in the world who came to see me uh, because he had gone through the same thing. And he told me that he had gone from 1979 to 1980 and lost a complete year of his life through alcohol. I couldn't remember a thing. So did you ever contemplate a suicide? Twice I've done it. Um, um, I, I talk about it flippantly, and it isn't a flippant thing to talk about. The first time was um, when I lived with my girlfriend and, uh, and Bernie in a, in, a, in a flat in London, and I, I staged a suicide where I put my head in the gas oven on a pillow, but I, I left the windows open. <laughs> <laughs> Turned the gas on and left the windows open. That's yes. called hedging your bets. Yes, yes, it is. Yeah. And the other time, it was in 1975, when I'd flown all my family and all our relations and all the office staff in London. I mean, we, we was, the things we used to do in those days, I mean, that money's much tighter, but we hired a 707 and just flew everybody over, you know, which is crazy now. Um, but we, I was playing Dodger Stadium for two days, but I was having a, um, my personal life, I was involved with somebody that I didn't want to know, but I thought because of my own huge ego that I could possibly get them in the end. And it all culminated in the fact that my parents, my grandmother was there, she'd, first time she'd been to America, or I think, out, let alone outside the country. And I had, a, I had a very nice house in Los Angeles, 
with a swimming pool. And one day I just took 85 Valiant, 10 strength Valiant, and swanned upstairs in my huge dressing gown, my terry robe dressing gown, and said, I've taken 85 Valiums, I should be dead within the hour, threw myself in the pool, and of course the dressing gown dragged me down, and then I'm sort of fighting for life, I'm trying to save myself. <laughs> and uh, the great thing around me is people, I, and I fly into a rage sometimes, uh, and people, like, the sort of person that can go into a temple and slam the door, and then sit there for 10 minutes and everybody leaves me alone, which is the complete best way to deal with me. And as I came out the pool, my grandmother, who was 80, and said, Oh, well, she's puffing around on cigarettes, which she does constantly. She says, I suppose we believe, believe we'll ought to pack and go home then. <laughs> <laughs> there are one or two marvellous stories, I don't know if they're true or not, but there's a marvellous story about you being found on top of a car, for instance. Is that a true story, John Bowman's car? Oh, yeah, that, yeah. What, 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 what was it? <laughs> well, it was a weekend and we'd been at a party someplace at his house, I believe. And we had to get everybody home. And uh, a lot of kids involved, you know. A lot of kids are here, and he has a lot of kids. And so it's a station wagon, so they all pile in, and all the nappies were dirty. And, you know, I, <laughs> and I wasn't in the mood for that, so I climbed on the roof. It was a station wagon, but he had, you know, he had a rack on the roof, so there's plenty to hold on to. Sure. So we took off like that. And well, what happened? You stopped by a policeman, weren't you? Yeah. Sitting on the roof of a car. That's right. Well, what did the policeman do? Oh, he just, you know, I knew the cop because I mean, yeah, you know. And so he just turned to John Bono, who's driving down below, and he says, "You know who you have on your roof?" And he said, "Yeah." And the cop said, "Oh, okay." What kind of reaction do you get from people? Because you you pop up in this situation in unexpected places, don't you? I mean, places where they would not expect to meet a princess. Well, I mean, what, what kind of reaction do you get then? Um, well, it's, sometimes it's, it's, it can be quite um, startling. Uh, I mean, I arrived on Saturday morning and went off to Werribee Park, which was where my husband was competing in the three-day event, and that was cross-country day. And uh, there were one or two fairly surprised people about it then, because I just, you know, put on a pair of jeans and went off to watch, walked about and walked the course. Um, and in fact, I had two or three conversations on my way around with people who were either riders or connected, who didn't seem to think it was very peculiar that I was there at all. But on Sunday, I was walking about, looking slightly less bohemian, and uh, a lady came up to me, definitely on the lookout. I mean, she wanted to ask me where something was. And she got, do you know? And then she went, ha! <laughs> Hours later, I still couldn't get out of her what it was that she meant to ask. So I, I gave up and carried on. I think she knows now. She knows now that she is. <laughs> Welcome back. Music now and some moments from the past two years featuring artists like Elton John, Cleo Lane and others, including a special event where Mr Ringo's star joined Glenn Shorrock in an impromptu musical rave on. Just can't keep still. I never knew me a better time, and I guess I never will. Oh, Lottie Mama, those Friday nights when Susie wore her dresses tight and cried out rocking was a kind of shy. Everybody. And out of date 
One thing to be said in favour of Australian politicians, particularly Prime Ministers, is that they don't take themselves as seriously as their American or British counterparts. It might be that to be an Australian politician, you need to be able to laugh at yourself. Whatever the reason, it gives the interviewer the chance to contrive some intriguing mixes. None more intriguing than when the then Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Malcolm Fraser, a man not renowned for getting belly laughs, appeared on the show with Mr Bob Hope. You are, in fact, still working in television. You're doing the, these television specials, aren't you, still? <laughs> You're kidding, aren't you? No. Oh. I just finished my 32nd year on television. I, I've done about 315 specials for NBC. Mm. Mm. And I still get a little nervous when I see, you know, to see that little NBC peacock. <laughs> Can you imagine that, getting nervous over a peacock? I... <laughs> <laughs> but... But, but is we're, the... we're in the same kind of business, the Prime Minister might as well, because politics and show business are a lot alike. You know, one day you're drinking the wine and the next day you're picking the grapes. <laughs> True. 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 What about you then? What about your favourite jibe? Well, I think, you know, uh, Michael, it refers to the Liberal Party in particular. They're a bit different to the Labour Party. They're always fighting amongst themselves. Oh. <laughs> and uh, on one occasion there, when Billy McMahon was elected Prime Minister, he then set out very energetically to remove most of the brains from his ministry. <laughs> and one who disappeared was Sir James and Tom Hughes and a few others, and they used to sit up the back of the house like eight or nine crows, and we used to call them the Cabinet in Exile, and we used to say they had more brains than the crowd down the front too. <laughs> But on one occasion, Billy Evansley was moved to say something about it, and he walked into the Parliament as Prime Minister, drew himself up to his full height, patted his chest and said dramatically to the eight or ten people listening throughout Australia, I am, I am my own worst enemy. And Killen interjected, not while I'm alive. <laughs> That period in 1972 was marvellous, because we had McMahon as Prime Minister and Whitlam as Leader of the Opposition. And it was a, a satirist or a mimic's dream. There has been no period in world history where you had two people who were so eminently mimicable. And so <clears throat> you could be in a television studio like this and you would have the, uh, the comp air here and you would have Billy over there. And another thing, it'll make a little bit of a bit of a possibility in the years and so on. I used to say that McMahon looked like the front end of a Volkswagen with both doors open. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd, have, you'd have Whitlam over the other side with this sort of Never before and never again. And the wonderful, you know, it's, it's never, never happened again. Did right you like? Do you like Gough Whitlam? Yeah, I, I admire him tremendously. Mm. I think he's fabulous. He's got mm. a sense of humour. Mm. Uh, not particularly about being sent up, but he, he does have this immensely dry sense of humour, and he basically likes journalists, which most prime ministers don't. Uh, and he. He can often vent his, his humour, his anger on them in a, in a humorous way. There was, a, there was one classic occasion. He hates the doorstop interview, what we call the, the curbside interview, where you sort of rush up panting and say, oh, excuse me, that one. And uh, he, he banned those. Nobody was supposed to do them. But occasionally an editor would send you out to, 
to get one. I'm Sue Smith, uh, who was then working with me at a current affair in Channel 9, was sent to do one of those things. And she was all dressed up, makeup, the lot, you know, expensive club, and she rushed up as, uh, as Goff was leaving, I think, the Wentworth Hotel in Sydney. And so, Mr. 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 And he said, I never talk to young women who accost me outside hotels. <laughs> What are the... Uh, have you added any new ones to your repertoire? I, I heard a whisper that you've got Joe Bielke, or you've been working on him recently. Jo yeah. Jo Joe is a, is a fairly easy... You just mumble. And you don't even have to write anything for Joe. I mean, with Whitlam, you have to write a line, or even Billy McMahon. But Joe, you just have to... It's just this string of, of adverbial clauses or something. So it's, um... It's my goodness me, I tell you, they say, you can't be here in Queensland, we know, like, goodness gracious me, you ask me that, but I, I'm telling you, we, we told you this. <laughs> That's politics, you see, and I, I tell you what, though, sometimes I feel I'd rather be in your line of business, in the time. Now, politics is full of uh, bloody prima donnas, mate. Uh, I'll tell you one thing, if you're in my game, you wouldn't get as paid as much as you do in yours. <laughs> you're, you're joking. Don't let me joke. But I mean, the prima donnas are bloody egos, you know. I've got Michael. Yeah. I've got people in my own party, you know, uh, people with such rigorous uh, intellects, you know, uh, great minds, such ever evanescent uh, national alarm, such uh, sensibility that they think it's in my responsibility as uh, Prime Minister of this great country to go around and tell leaders of other great countries, in respect of whom that we're in a situation of friendship. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, and I, with whom uh, we depend for security, for uh, trade and, you know, fiscal stimulus. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and people with whom I'm in a cultivating a situation of friendship and with whom Hazel is in a situation of culling their wives' friendships, where they have wives, of course. And, uh, you know, <laughs> these great patriots of the Australian Labor Party, these uh, stalwarts of socialism, you know, these great blokes sitting under their banyan trees, you know, <laughs> they expect me to go around the world telling other world leaders that they've got bad table manners, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, their wife's too fat, or their husband's uh, nincompoop or something, or I don't like their films. In short, Michael, and yourself. Uh, I'm, expected, I'm expected to tell these great people around the world, as far as Australia is concerned, they can all piss off. <laughs> okay. What do you reckon? Oh, it's an element of truth, isn't it? <laughs> Look, will Mr. Hawk tell the audience? Uh, why it was necessary to fly around the world like some sort of, uh, uh, you know, um, some sort of charismatic, um, some sort of, you know, migrating mutton bird, uh, <laughs> to find the same policies that I, my government, uh, had for seven years, and uh, which uh, allegedly I was, uh, <laughs> you know, I was removed for. <laughs> That's, that's the longest question I've ever heard, sir, whoever you might be. And the Prime Minister has equal time for reply. Well, uh, Malcolm, uh, let, let, me, let me say, um, before I answer it, give my love to Tammy. Um, uh, let me say that I, I had to go around the, the world be, because of an event that happened on the 5th of March. I don't want to remind you of it. And, um, so I had to go around and talk to a few people. But, but, but really, there, there, there's one thing that I want to tell you about the trip, which is probably answer your question very succinctly. You know, I went to um, Indonesia and uh, I had some time with President Suharto. And um, you may recall that when you had this job, um, you, uh, you gave a present to President Suharto. And that uh, present, uh, Malcolm, you'll recall, and ladies and gentlemen, was a bull. <laughs> and I had to go there to find out <laughs> that that present that you sent there hasn't worked. In other words, I had to go <laughs> all the way to Indonesia to find that your bull doesn't work. <laughs>
Looking back is to be reminded how fortunate the interviewer is in being able to meet a wide range of remarkable people. It's like being the host at a dinner party, allowed to invite anyone he's ever wanted to meet. And like a dinner party, some work, some don't. Some people you invite and wish you hadn't, others exceed all expectations. I'll leave you tonight with a memory of two people who left an indelible impression on me and who sadly have died in the past 12 months or so. One was an old lady called Enid Lorimer. Physically, she was frail and as transparent as an autumn leaf. Mentally, she was so alert, alive, witty, and wise that she made old age a celebration of living. The other was a dear friend of mine, a great journalist and a marvelous man, Jack Fingleton. Now, when I think of Enid and Jack, I'm reminded of a story told me by film director Brian Forbes about Dame Edith Evans. Brian visited Edith as she was dying in hospital. When he returned home, his young daughter asked him how Dame Edith was. Brian told her the bad news. His daughter thought for a moment and then said, but Dame Edith won't die, Daddy. She's not the type. Well, that's how I feel about Enid and Jack. Not dead, but just resting. So I'll leave you with a reminder of two very special people and the thought that the joy of this job has been the privilege of meeting people like them. The compliments of the season to you, and until next time, good night. Why is it that of all sports, cricket's got the richest treasury of sporting pros? Why does it attract good writers the way it does? Well, I think the game in itself is so slow, it gives plenty of time for <laughs> reflection. <laughs> uh, plenty of time for thinking, but uh, the whole atmosphere, the setting, and people who played it and associated with it are all inspiring, I think. I like the story about Sir James Barry, and it's lovely to see slow bowling coming back again. We might get onto that in a minute. But James Barry used to consider himself the slowest bowler in the world. He said, when I bowl the ball, he said, if I don't like the look of it, I'll go after it and bring it back again. <laughs> And I sit there mopping up cop shop. Uh, I like cop shop. I love young doctors. I will not miss young doctors. Uh, I was very angry when they took Skyways off. I loved it. And, um, and Enid, uh, have you ever thought about an epitaph? Have you ever thought about how you'd like to be remembered? Dame Edith Evans said forever when I asked her that question. <laughs> Hereafter, in a better world than this, I shall desire more love and knowledge of you. Enid Lorimer. Thank you. <laughs>